that are fit for the master's use. Give us ears that are prepared to hear, a mind that's able to understand, but most importantly, a heart that has the capacity to receive the truth that you desire to impart in our lives. Remove any strife, resentment, bitterness, anything from our heart that is not pleasing to you. And we pray, O oh God, as the psalmist prayed when he said, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Let the words of my my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Yes, we're here because of your grace, and yes, we're here because of your unfailing mercy. But we are also here and we are also alive because before the earth was ever created, you saw us doing something. We were created for a specific purpose. You spoke to Jeremiah the prophet and you told him that before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you, I called you, I had a plan, I sanctified you, I set you apart for a work. And so, Father, I'm asking that what you saw me doing, what you saw Marvin doing before I was ever given my name, before I ever was birthed into the earth, what you planned and purposed, what you saw me doing in heaven, I pray that it would be seen here today in the presence of these, your people. And in so doing, number one, that your name would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. And number two, that your people would be blessed. We thank you, Heavenly Father, and we believe that we have received everything we just requested in the wonderful, the marvelous, the matchless name of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And all of God's people did say amen and amen. Uh, let's go ahead and have our confession of faith this morning. Um, please take your Bibles or any uh, devices, electronic devices that you may have and uh, just lift them up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. This is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. Do you truly believe that? Hallelujah. Amen and amen. There are a couple of scriptures that I want to read into your hearing this morning. If you would stand with me to your feet. And um, one of these scriptures that I'm about to read um, to you. It is considered to be the Hebrew confession of faith. Uh, it is referred to in the Hebrew as the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, and it means to hear. That's what Shema means. It's found in Deuteronomy, and uh, can you please put it on the screen for me? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4, and I think we're going to read down through verse number 9. Are you ready? Let's read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Read that again. And thou shalt love the Lord. Not some of your heart. Not 50%, not 75%, but before anything else, we are to love him with all of our heart and then with all of our soul my will my thoughts my emotions remember this acronym wet that is what the soul of man consists of your will your emotions and your thoughts and your soul and with all of thy might that word um speaks to it it really means vehemently we're supposed to love him passionately we are supposed to love him vehemently and uh you can go to the next verse and these words which I command thee this day. Now follow this. Not only do I want these words in your heart, look at what I'm going to do or what I want you to do in order to keep them in the center of your being. Let's keep going. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Stop believing and looking for the school, the government, or someone else. Stop worrying about what your children are exposed to when they get to school because if you would take the time and do this 
and teach them at home and train up a child in the way that they should go, you wouldn't have to worry about all of the other foolishness. So stop rolling your responsibility over on governmental authorities and over entities. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt... And when thou walkest in the way, and when thou... And thou shalt bind them for a sign... In other words, scribble the word on the palms of your hands, and they shall be as... If you've ever seen Orthodox Jews or Hasidic Jews, they have a little black patch that's right here. They have scriptures in that patch, and they tie it around their heads because they're trying to honor this and keep the word of God in a place of preeminence and in the forefront of their thoughts. Keep going. And thou shalt write... In other words, when I go in and when I go out, I'm supposed to be reminded of the Word of God and that the Word of God should take preeminence and precedence over everything else that I do throughout the day. Continue. <laughs> Y'all are tired too. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gate. All right, now let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. That's the way that God put it forth in the New Testament. Let's put, look at how Jesus put it in the New Testament. He said, but seek ye first. Amen. You may be seated. If you read Matthew chapter 3, you will find that Jesus talks about how we get overly concerned about the cares and the necessities of life. We worry about what we're going to eat. We worry about what we're going to drink. We worry about all of these things. And he said, you don't have to worry about these things. In modern day colloquialism, you hear people say, I've got to go get the bag. I've got to chase the bag. And so you're worried and consumed about having enough. But Jesus said this. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. In other words, seek ye first God's governance, submit yourself to God's way of doing things in every area of your life, and if you will seek the kingdom of heaven and give it a place of preeminence, he said, you will not have to run after the bag. The bag will run after you. And I, I know that some of you have been taking care of yourselves for so long, you simply believe that you have to go and get it. You got to hustle. I mean, you got to make things happen. But God says, if you will just stop and pause and give me a place of preeminence, make me a part of the prioritization of your life, you will never have to worry about things. Things will automatically find you. And so we're going to talk about today uh, living a prioritized life, living a prioritized life. Now, um, I gave you guys my travel schedule, and I told you that, uh, that I was very tired, and I want to say thank you to the cadre of ministers that we have here and servant leaders, because they are such a tremendous help, and whenever, <laughs> hallelujah, and, um, and whenever I'm absent, you never have to worry about the quality or the standard of ministry because it is always excellent. As a matter of fact, some of them preach better than I do. And so I thank God for that. And so I could have easily said, well, I'm going to go ahead and stay home because I'm going to be on the road for the next two weeks and I'm tired because of the trip that I just uh, came away from. But this is a priority. You don't understand. This is a priority. And when something is a priority in your life, even when you're tired, even when you don't feel like it, you make necessary sacrifice because it is a priority. And it's amazing because most of the times when I've gotten in trouble in life, I've gotten in trouble because my life has somehow gotten out of whack and I've lost and I've gotten things misprioritized. How many of you remember the greatest king that Israel ever had before Jesus came into the earth? He was a king whose name was David. And the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, please, let me, let me say this. Let me preface this before I get deep into this message. I don't get this right all the time. So don't think that I'm preaching to you or talking to you because I mess up just like you guys do. And a lot of times I just haul off and do things without, get, without giving God first place or a place of preeminence. And so please don't think that I'm speaking to you in a condescending or self-righteous uh, self uh, place. That's not where I'm coming from. Because all of us sometimes we just do stuff and we don't really consult God before we do it. I gave you all just a few minutes ago my schedule for the next couple of months. But Paul said, when you say that, what you should say, be it God's will. 
You see, in other words, you know, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. No, you will do it if God gives you the grace to do it. You will do it if God allows you to do it. But, and so before you even speak of it, realize that if God gives me grace and I live, I shall do such and such and such. And so the Lord talks to the children of Israel. And again, this is the Shema. Um, this is the part of the Hebrew confession of faith. And he says that we are supposed to love the Lord. And then he says, there is a way that you should love the Lord. Before I get any further in this message, how many of you, by show of hands, can lift your hands and say that I'm a Christian? Or at least you believe you're a Christian. The overwhelming majority of people that are in this place. Okay, as a Christian, what place have you given God in your life? What priority have you given God in your life? Is is, is God truly... Uh, the person that you consult before you get into a relationship? Is God truly the person that you go to first and talk to him first before you take that new job? Do you talk to God first? Do you acknowledge God first um, before you buy a home or before you make major life decisions? Or do we just go ahead and we do some things and then after we've already made up our minds what we're going to do and we're in the process of doing those things that we fall back on God and ask God to bless something after we've already decided what we're going to do? You see, and, and God says, that is not how I want you to live. That's not the, the relationship that I want with you. God says, I want first place in the relationship. Before you do anything, even when you're parenting, how should I parent my children? Should I allow uh, modern day psychologists, child psychologists, or modern day paradigms, or cultural paradigms, should I allow them to tell me how I parent my child? Or should I go to the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about parenting and then submit myself and my children to the... See, that's what's called keeping God first. When God says, I want you to love me with all of your heart, that's what he means. How many times do we do things and we don't even ask God, God, is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I take this engagement? Um, <laughs> We, we, we just go ahead and we do things and we, we relegate God to a second or third place in our lives. And then we wonder why we're not experiencing God's best. There are some of you, there are some people that are listening to me right now. You're involved in relationships that you know are ungodly relationships. But the reason that you won't get out of the relationship, we make convenient, expu- convenient excuses so that we don't give God a place of preeminence. Because we want to do what we want to do. You know what I found out about human beings? Human beings will do what they want to do. They'll tell you, yes, I'm going to do something. But if they really don't want to do it, that yes doesn't mean anything. People are going to do what they want to do. I have resigned myself to this. But at this point in my life, do you know what I want to do? I want to honor God with my life. Because we are living in a place now where people are looking for the true church because they know that in the true church, I'm supposed to find someone whose name is Jesus. And so if I don't prioritize God, if I make other things a priority, then people won't see Christ in me. And so all of us have a responsibility. We have to get serious because I don't think you realize what time it is. Pause and reflect upon what I'm about to tell you. Do you know that everything is in place for revelation to happen right now? Let me say that again. I want you to think about AI and where we are. And do you know that everything is in place for the book of Revelation to be fulfilled except for the main characters have not been revealed yet? Do you know that you can be dead and people can can make it seem like you're still alive? Do you know in Revelation it talks about uh, there's going to be this false prophet who's, who's dead for three days and he's going to rise back up? Do you know everything is in place to make that look real to you? You see, and we're going about life and we're doing life, but we're not really thinking about where we are. And as far as I'm concerned, if Jesus came right now, I would say, Lord, thank you. I don't want to stay. Now, I'm not saying I want to die, Lord. That's not what I'm saying. (laughs) All right. 
But if you came back right now and you said, Marvin, let's go ahead and let's go home, I would gladly, as much as I love you all, as much as I love Deborah, as much as I love my children, as much as I want to see certain things happen in my life, if he showed up right now, I would put all of that to the side. And I said, Lord, okay, I'm ready to go with you because to be with him, oh, man. Just to be, because in his presence there is a fullness of joy. And do you know what? There is no car, there is no suit, there is no money, there is nothing on this earth that's worth more than being with him. And you have to get to that point in your life where I would give up everything, my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, just to be with you. When you are not in that particular place in life, you put yourself and your desires before him. Let's get to the word. And so he says, now I'm supposed to love him. And then God says, there's a black, well, let me show y'all how important this is to God because um, I want you to see it when he talks about loving. I want you to love me with your whole heart because you remember uh, there was a guy that came to Jesus and asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said that thou shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So this isn't the first time that we've heard this, but I want to drive home a point and show you just how important that God says that he needs a place of preeminence in your life. I want to show you how important that is. And so I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12. Now we just looked in, in, in chapter 6, but I want to show you something. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12, watch this. And now Israel, what does the Lord... Um, can, I know King James is hard for some people. Let, let's go ahead and modernize. <laughs> and uh, let's switch to the NIV. We'll read this one, then we'll... Okay, here it is. And now, Israel, what does the Lord uh, your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him? Look at this. To love Him, to serve the Lord your God with what? Your... So now we've got a couple of witnesses where God says, this is important. I want you to love me with everything, heart, mind, and soul. But that's not it. He says it again. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse number 1. I want to show you these because whenever you see something uh, in, in the Bible over and over and over again, God is trying to let you know that this is something that is very, very important. No human being is more important than your relationship with the Lord. Ooh, that's hard. I love Deborah Jackson. I'm at a point now where after 46 years. Y'all young folk don't know what love is. It takes time to understand what love is. After a while, you begin to realize that love transcends the physical. When I was a young man, love was like physical all the time, all the time, stick and move. I mean, but <laughs> as you get older, you realize that love, y'all laughing, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. But as you get older, you begin to look at the person and appreciate who they are. You begin to look at their heart and appreciate their heart and who they are. You begin to love them for them and not what they can do for you. But yet, as much as I love Deborah Jackson, she says, don't be telling people that you love. Every time we start fussing, you know what she says to the house? Stop telling people that you love me at church. You don't love me because you really love me. <laughs> But as much as I love her, my love for God cannot take a second place to the relationship that I... Now, I know that's hard. That's hard. I love my children, my, my daughters, my sons. If they ask me to do anything, if it is within my power and my wherewithal to do it, guess what? I'm going to do it. But as much as I love them, the love for God has to take first place. Now, we sit there and we nod, but I want you to think about that for a moment because that is challenging. That is challenging because if I truly love God, how do I prove to God that I love God? I prove to God that I love God by trying to do things His way. Proverbs, I want to show you something. I think it's Proverbs chapter 3 and, uh, and verse number 5. Let's go there for a moment. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Isn't that so easy to read? How many of you, that's one of your favorite scriptures? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not thy understanding, but not in all thy ways. It, 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 it's something else, isn't it? But do you really trust God? When you get to a point where you really trust God, worry leaves your life. 
Because you get to a point where you don't care and you realize if God doesn't do this, it won't get done. So what I'm going to do, instead of worry about my predicament, I'm going to praise God in the middle of my predicament, knowing that all things are working together for my good, and that this day, this season that I'm in, is not a season of surprise to God. He knew about the season before it came, and if God knew about the season that you're going through before it came, He prepared you for it before it showed up. And he will sustain you and he will keep you in the middle of it. And we worry and we worry and we stress. Our hair falls out and we don't eat. We have high blood pressure and all of these other physical symptoms because we truly have not learned to put all of our trust in God. Trust God like you trust the seat you're sitting in this morning. Now somebody doesn't even know what I just said. Trust God like the seat that you're sitting in this morning. How many of you walked into the sanctuary this morning and checked the structural integrity of the chair that you're sitting in to see if it was strong enough to hold you? Did you put 5% of your weight and say, okay, let me give another, another 15%. You just dropped that big old ton, just boom, just right there. <laughs> And you didn't even give it a second thought. You simply believed that that chair was able to hold you and to sustain you and to keep you. When you came down I-4, whatever way you took to go to church, you did, when you passed over the overpass, you did not stop your car, go down and check the structural integrity of the concrete that was holding the bridge. You simply drove your car over it without thinking. See, God says, I want you to trust me just like this. I am going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. And listen, even when things are rough, even when you have to cry sometimes, God has a promise that on the other side of this, the situation that you just went through is not a wasted situation. That situation is preparing you for something bigger, for something better. And so God... I trust that you did not send this situation to kill me, but I'm supposed to grow into this development. I'm supposed to develop in this situation that I'm in because you're preparing me for another level of faith. Yeah. Oh, that we would truly trust the Lord to make a way for us instead of the, us trying to make a way for ourselves. And that's what we try to do. We try to make a way for ourselves. We try to, to put, our place, put ourselves in places sometimes that God never ordained for us to go. Yeah. I see so many young pastors. Now, I just, I'm at a place now where I just sit back and watch people try to create platforms for themselves. Don't you know if you trust God, if God has a platform for you, you won't have to force your way into it. You won't have to politic your way into it. You won't have to back end your way into it. If God has a place for you, that door will open for you in its season. Trust in God. I was watching LaRue. Um, I follow her on Instagram. And every time I see her and what she's doing, I'm like, God, look at you. Look at how you're doing. Because she was faithful in the place where she was. She was never manipulating or maneuvering or trying to go here or to do this. She simply remained faithful in the little place where she was until God decided to honor and promote her faithfulness. And now she's standing on a stage much bigger than the stage that she was on before. Why? Because she was faithful where she was. Yeah. And if you'll simply trust God and be faithful where you are and make pleasing God a priority, when it's time for you to go to your next level, you won't even, it'll be a sweatless move. God will just elevate you and bless you if you just trust him. Amen. And so let's go back to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. That's when we get in trouble. When we try to figure it out our way. Because we figure we know how to do it. How many of you all have a problem with your, uh, with your GPS system in your car? Yeah. You have a problem with Waze, you disobey Waze, you disobey <laughs> Apple Maps, you disobey Google Maps, because you don't trust them. You see, you figure that I know how to get there. I cannot tell you how many times that these applications have told me this is how you get from point A to point B, but I said I have gone there before, I know the route, and this is the best route, and the route that you're about to take me does not seem like the most expeditious route, so I'm going to take the route that I know, and I took the route that I knew, and there was a traffic jam because I did not trust God, you see. And so we're going to have to learn to trust in the Lord. Do you know, it's, it's hard trusting in the Lord sometimes when you haven't seen a sign in a long time. Good, have you ever been on a journey somewhere driving and you were supposed to get to a certain city or a certain destination, but you were driving 
and driving and driving, and you thought you were going the right way, but you never saw a sign that said destination 10 miles ahead or exit. You're just driving and you're driving. Isn't it a relief when you finally, especially when you're going someplace that you don't know where you're going, when you finally see a sign, lets you know that you are on the right track. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to trust Him even when you don't see a sign. He wants you to trust Him even when you've been traveling for a long time and you see no evidence of reaching your destination. He wants you to trust Him when it seems like life has fallen apart and everything is in a mess. He wants you to trust Him, that, that trust in the fact that He is going to get you to your destination. Have you all ever heard this, come hell or high water? Come hell or high water, God is going to get you to your destination. Just trust me. And so he says, going back to my scripture, he says, don't lean on your own understanding. He said, but acknowledge him in all thy ways. This is where I want to stop. This is how you give God a place of preeminence. By stopping and pausing and acknowledging him in your ways. That $1.3 million, that ABL upgrade that I was talking about, that's a lot of money. And... Um, and then the, the technological advancements and what the equipment will allow us to do is really going to be put there for the next minister that comes along because I'll be moving along, kind of retiring by, by, by that time. And so I don't know where anything is going to come from, but I've got to learn how to trust the Lord. When we were building this building, one of the things I had to learn how to do was trust the Lord. Past, the, the Lord past, taught Pastor Deborah a, a, a very good lesson about trusting the Lord when we were building this building. Architects are visionaries. They're creative people. And they were walking through the building. I said, oh, we need to do this, and we can put a water fountain up here and all. And I was saying, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. She pulled me off to the side one night. You need to stop telling these people to make all these changes when you know that that is not provided for in our budget. You know? And we had so many different fusses about that. And so one night we came up here when it was dark. And uh, this was nothing like this. It was in pre-construction. We shouldn't have been up here. And she was fussing at me about something, about not believing God. And she was right over there. She slipped and fell. I said, see? <laughs> I said, God don't like ugly. <laughs> you see? And, uh, but isn't it funny? How many of you have had situations where you had to trust God to bring you out? And he brought you out? So if he brought you out of the last situation, if he brought you out of some of those things that you will never, ever forget, what makes you think? See, the Bible says, what shall we say to these things? When I look back on those things and what God has done before, see, when you know what God can do, you won't be perplexed by what's standing in front of you. Let me say it again. When you know what God can do, you won't be stumped by what's standing in front of you. Because I can look back over my life and see where he's done it time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. So what makes you think that God has brought you to this point in your life to totally embarrass you and abandon you and leave you? He is not going to abandon you. He is not going to leave you. He's not going to let you be an embarrassment. The Lord is going to hold you up with his right hand. And I'm telling you that when God sustains you, no human being on the planet can bring you down when God is holding you up. If God be for us. So he said, acknowledge him in all of your ways. All right, let's talk about something that's funny. Okay. Um, when my children were born, especially Brad, okay, Brad was the first son that Deborah and I had together. And uh, I wanted to, I wanted him to have a godly name. <laughs> I'm not going to bother. If, if your name is Shaniqua, Tambula, Tambula, whatever, don't worry about it. But all right, I, I'm not doubting your name if you have an ethnic name, whatever the case. But I wanted my son to have a biblical name. And I was very strategic about the name that I chose. Because when Joseph was in prison in Pharaoh's house, he had two sons during those years when he was there with Pharaoh. One child's name was Manasseh. The other child's name was Ephraim. Manasseh means God has caused me to forget my hardship. Ephraim means the Lord has made me fruitful. See, the reason some of you are not fruitful is because you haven't forgotten your pain yet. You're still bitter. You're not, you haven't forgiven some people. But see, he says, God has caused me to forget my misery, and now Ephraim shall be fruitful. So I said, I want his name to be Ephraim. I thought everybody was on the same page biblically with me name-wise. I get back, and on the boy's birth certificate, it's spelled E-F-R-E-M. And I'm like, that ain't Bible. 
The Bible is E-P-H-R-I-A-M. That's Ephraim. Y'all named the boy after Ephraim Zimulus Jr., uh, I mean, <laughs> who was a television. I said, that's the wrong name. But my point was, the point of me telling you that was this, is I wanted to honor God in the naming of my child. Now, that may not seem, I don't know what happened with Adrian and Andre. I forgot about it with, with, with Brad. I wanted <laughs> But, but you understand my point. But I wanted God to have a, this was my, my, my first, our firstborn. And so I wanted to acknowledge God and give him a biblical name that spoke prophetically to where I believed that God was going to take him. You see, that's what I mean by honoring God and giving God, even in the smallest decisions of that nature, God, what is it that you would want me to do? Do you know why God blessed the life of Jesus so much? Jesus said, I don't do what I want to do. He said, everything I do and everything I say, I get approval from the Father first. And then that's what I do. He would not allow men to dictate and to put him in a place or to have him, you know, here's the thing about people. Sometimes people want you to be what they want you to be. And they want you to act the way that they want you to act. And they'll be in love with you as long as you do that. But as soon as you don't do that, then people will fall out with you. Jesus was not concerned about the opinions of man. He said, it's more important for me to please God than to bow to the whims of men of mankind. And so you have to get to a point where the opinions of God matter more than the opinions of men. What if we spent more time trying to please God and impress God than impress people? A whole lot of stuff we do now, we do to impress people. We're not, we don't give God a place to party. Sometimes when we get up and we come to church and, and ladies are out shopping and you buy that dress. Have y'all ever bought it? I'm a man. I never bought a dress. But I can imagine some of y'all buying a dress and looking in the mirror to see where it hits. But you're going to wear it to church. <laughs> but you want, you want to, oh, child, I'm going to knock them out and I'm going to kill them. <laughs> I'm going to kill them when I go to church on Sunday. <laughs> Now, where, where's your pro, where, is your priority on worship or is your priority on you want every? I've been pastoring for a long time. I have seen people walk in church and they just. I remember one time I was standing back there. This lady, she's gone now. And she walked, and I knew she wanted me to see it. And I looked too. I, I looked. I, I ain't going to lie. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and tell you I didn't look because when that walked by, I, like, I was trying to be holy. And I was like, <laughs> you know. But do you understand that's not giving God a place of preeminence in our mindset and in our thinking? You buy shoes. And ladies, I'm not trying to beat you all up. And you buy shoes. You buy shoes. Okay, let's, let's do something else. When we come to worship, you're not giving God a place of preeminence. You want the worship leader to sing the song that you like. I want you to sing the song that takes me in. Can I tell you something? Worship was never about you. Your priorities are strong. You, you mad at the choir at the praise team because they didn't sing the song that you like. I thought we were supposed to sing the songs that he likes. But because we've given ourselves the place for it, we do what we want that makes us feel good. What about what makes God feel good? When we give God a place of preeminence in our lives, God will say, I want you to go out and apologize. I, God, I, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do that because, Lord, y'all have not, are going back and forth with God over that situation where you felt like you were right and there was no need for you to apologize. And God says, I want you to apologize. And you try to pretend like you didn't hear God. <laughs> you talking about, now, was that my mind? <laughs> Or was that the Holy Spirit? And we come up with these convenient excuses because we don't want to submit and bend our will to the ways of God. Some of us have secret struggles that nobody knows about. They're little things that you are doing in your life that you just assume that this is just between myself and God. And God understands my nature, but God has spoken to you and told you, that's not pleasing to me. I want you to stop doing that. But what you do and what I do sometimes is we place the desires of our flesh before our desire to please God. I'm not getting any amens. Anybody saying, you write about it, Pastor. That's all right. I'm just trying to tell you. But when you get to this intimate place with God, God will begin to speak to you about things about your character, things that you do that nobody knows about that he wants you to change. And sometimes, do you know, it can take years. Okay, let me tell you all a real story, right? How many of you know that I'm not a fan of the former president? (laughs) Have you noticed that in the last few years you see nothing, 
nothing posted on my page. You see, all, all, that, all that rhetoric has, has changed in my life. It's not because I all of a sudden liked the guy, but the Lord began to speak to me about something, and so I had to put the other stuff aside and honor God first. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because I want God to have a place of preeminence. Now, do I fail at it? I fail at it a lot. When Deborah and I are going back and forth, sometimes if, y'all, if you all saw us, you would say, that's not my pastor's. <laughs> y'all, say, no, y- y'all go to that church. I don't know who that pastor is. But do you know that sometimes the Lord will tell you just as plainly, be quiet. Go to a neutral corner. What is it about husbands and wives that make us think that in order to win the argument, we must have the last word, even if it's a last sound? <laughs> we got to have the last word. And then somehow we are, we are mystically declared the winner. And so when we run out of words to say, we say, hmm. <laughs> then the other person looks at you and hmm, too. So you're acting stupid. Hmm, hmm, hmm. And all the Holy Ghost wants you to do, which, but we want to be right. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. When it comes to giving God a place to preeminence, let's, let's talk about our money for a second. Let's talk about our finances. Okay. Now, um, I don't have any preacher hype in me as it relates to trying to connive you or to manipulate you or handle the word skillfully in such a way to, to get you to give. Either you love God or you don't love God. That's the way that I look at it. I am not the pastor to come before you and try to scare you into giving and tell you, you are cursed with a curse. Y'all remember we used to go to church and, and every, we knew the scripture that was coming every time offering came around. You, will a man rob God? I've seen churches that take the list of tithers. Maybe some of you have not experienced this, but they actually type the list of the people that tithe, and they put it outside. And I've also seen churches that type the list, the names of people that are non-tithers, and put that outside. What kind of foolishness is that? If you're going to love God and you're going to give to God, it has to come from your heart. You can give $100,000, and it matters nothing to God. Now, I'll take it, but... I'm, I'm not going to say before you give it to me, have you consulted God? Is this really what God wants you to do? I'm going to go ahead and... No, 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 no. Because it's not about that. You see, God doesn't look at what you do. God looks at why did you do what you did. You see? So never put people in a position where they feel like they have to posture themselves to please God. So when it comes to, to, to finances, I've been broke and I'm at a place now where I'm not broke. But I decided when I was broke, when I didn't have nothing, I just got to a point where I decided I'm going I'm to trust God with this. And it took me a while. It, took, it is not easy, but it took me a while. And now, Deborah Jackson is the Secretary of Finance in the Kingdom of Jacksonia. And so she handles all financial matters. Am I the man that gives my check to, to my wife? Yes, I am. Uh, if you give me an offering and she finds out about it, she's going to take it. Um, she, she's going to take it. Um, and this is what she's going to... And she will ask me, did anybody give you any money? And I have to say yes. And, uh, and, I, have to, and I have to tell her how much. You call me henpecked all you want. I've been in this for 46, almost 50 years. So, so you say whatever you want to say, you know. And so... And so she handles that. And the first thing that she does is she sits down and she takes 10% off the top, come blank or high water. And she's going to give that to God. And then the other stuff that we give over to other people, that's just a blessing. Why? Because I've decided to make God a priority. Right now, if I ask the people in this church, If I ask everybody in this church, and they were all here, has Pastor ever given you anything? They would stand and say, he's given me cars, he's given me golf clubs, he's given me grills, he's given me this, he's given me that. Why? And so I know that when I honor God through giving, it will come back some kind of way. God is going to cause it to come back to me. And listen, I trust God with that. Now, that is not always easy. I told you all one time, God told me to send my pastor $10,000. It took three months before I did it. Because I kept going back and forth. I'm like, Lord, that's a lot of money, you know. And, and, and I know my pastor is straight and whatnot. And, uh, 
And so I, I, I knew everything was all right. And, and God came and talked to me one morning, and he talked to me in such a forceful way. I called Deborah on the way to the golf course. I said, Deborah, write a check and send it to Pastor Jenkins. And I, and I trusted God. And guess what? It's come back over and over and over and over again. You see, when God gives you, and this is what God will do to see if you've given him a place of preeminence. Have you ever noticed in the Bible there's a pattern? God gives an instruction. Then he waits to see if the person that he's given the instruction to will follow the instruction. After the person follows the instruction, that's when they get the blessing. You see, but this is the kind of people that we are. We want to see manifestation and proof that is coming before we take the act of faith. Can you all put Hebrews 10.35 up there? Hebrews 10.35, and I'm getting ready to go home. Church, the only thing I want you all to do and that I want to get better at is I want to give God first place. I want to acknowledge him. And, and, and the reason I say I fail a lot, when um, the pastors contacted me and asked me if I would be interested on going on this tour with them to Israel, do you know I didn't even ask God? You know what I said? Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't laugh, because y'all do the same thing. They paid for everything. The only thing I had to pay for was the upgrade. And so it was basically a free trip. And they asked me if I wanted to go and told me the people that I would be traveling with, the other pastors, and what we would be doing. And that was on my bucket list. I've never been to Israel before. And so I just said, yeah. Now, how do I know that it's God's will for me to go on that trip? I didn't even, ign I didn't even acknowledge God. I just said, yeah. Because you know what? We've gotten so callous in our lives until we don't even think to acknowledge God. We just say yes and no. And we won't even take a couple of seconds and say, wait, wait a minute, I'll give you my reply. Can you give me a day or so? Let me go and talk to the Lord about it. Because that seems too, too holy. That seems too spiritually off. And so we just say yes and no. And God can stop my life and I'll never be able to take that trip again. I didn't even acknowledge God. Why did I tell you that? Because I'm not preaching at you. I'm saying that we're all in the same place where we need to work harder on giving God a place of priority in our lives. And listen, let me, let me show you something. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse number 13. I want to show you something. Because God says, when you give me a place of priority, I'll bless your life. Did you know that? See, I hadn't told you that part yet. God says, if you will simply give me a place of priority and preeminence, I will bless every area of your life. Your children will be blessed. Your health will be blessed. You will have a blessed state of mind. Your career will be blessed. Everything you put your hands to do, he said, I'll bless it if you'll simply give me a place of priority. Now watch this. He says, and it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently to my commands when I command you this day to look. Here it is again. To love the Lord your God and to serve him how? And with all your soul, keep reading. Just keep, keep going. Next verse. That I will give you the rain of your land in due season. Now you say, well, why do I want it to rain? You have to understand that during the time that this was written, the people of Israel lived in an agrarian society, an agrarian culture, which means their wealth was measured by their agriculture, how many crops they produced, how many animals that they had. And if God withheld the rain, that was a curse because their, cop, their crops couldn't produce, and it basically brought a famine in the land because the, the livestock had to eat the crops. And so if rain didn't come, everything stops. So what God says is he says, I'm going to give you rain in your land in its due season. You're going to have plenty. Everything is going to be coming up. Everything is going to prosper. God says, I'm going to water your blessing. And then he says, the first rain and the latter rain. In other words, I'm going to still be blessing you when you get old. And then he goes on to say this, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. Do you know what all the, whenever you read in the Bible, corn, wine, and oil, do you know what that means? That is symbolic of joy. God says, I'm going to bless you with joy. I'm going to bless you with peace. I'm going to bless you with contentment. It does not matter if you have two or three million dollars in the bank, if you cannot sleep. It does not matter if you have unlimited wealth, but your health is jacked up. It does not matter how much much money you have if you have agoraphobia and you're afraid to even go outside. It does not matter how much money you have if your wife or your husband is running around and tipping on you and your children are half crazy. It does not matter. 
The blessing that you are looking for is the blessing in Proverbs 10, 22 that says, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and... Say it again. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and... I'm getting ready to close. We're going to take communion and go home. How many of you remember a few years ago when, when Michael Jackson died? Um, one of the things that I did, because I'm always on the Internet doing something, is I Googled uh, his autopsy report. Now, I know that seems morbid to some of you, but here is a person who, from the outside, it looked like he had everything going. But when you look at his autopsy, he was emaciated. His body was in horrible condition. But on the outside, see, here's the thing about cosmetics. The Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. If you look at the Greek meaning for world, it means cosmos, cosmetics. Did you know that? Have you ever heard this word, the cosmos? Okay, so world, it comes from the Greek word cosmos, cosmetic. Now, when you talk about going online, have you ever gone online and, and watched women's makeup videos? Trust me, that is pure sorcery they got going on there, <laughs> all right, because God knows I have been on TikTok and YouTube, and I saw them when they started, <laughs> and when they started, and I looked at I'm like, ooh, Jesus, no, no way, and I sat there patiently, and I watched them put layer upon layer upon layer. I saw them do it with a lady that had no teeth. And they put layer, and, and when they finish, I'm like, hmm, you know what? If I was in the club and I was out in the world after, after a couple of tangerays and, and coats, you know, that, you understand what I'm saying, you know? And um, I'm, I'm not there, but I'm saying, you know, you, you, and, and then you go, you, you go home, and, and then, okay, so now you're with this person, and they remove all of their makeup. And you wake up in the morning, and you look over at the person. It, <laughs> Now, y'all are laughing, but I want you to think about it. Everything that is in this world, listen to me, everything that is in this world, in this cosmos, is an outward veneer of something that's not really real. And God is saying, be careful about the cosmos. Don't get caught up in the world, but give me a place of preeminence in your life, and I will bless your life. Did you get anything out of the Word of God today? I'm not going to have an altar call. I'm going to leave this up to you personally, but sometimes we need to just repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry, because I've gotten so caught up in doing life my way that I have really, really forgotten to seek you first. I've really forgotten not to lean to my own understanding. And so, Father, what I'm going to do today after this message is I'm going to work on getting better at prioritizing my life and giving you a place of preeminence and giving you first place. Now, for some of you, it's going to be easy, and for some of you, it's going to be hard. Because while I was preaching this message today, some of you have some really difficult situations. I'll, give it, I'll put it to you like this. Sometimes people live together, they call it a common law relationship. And they do it for the, con the convenience of economics and finance. Do you know what I mean? So they move in together because it's easier with two checks coming in you know and so when you did that at the beginning you guys weren't in a relationship but now it's evolved into something else and God is telling you I want you to stop that but your trust isn't in God yet and so you're wondering how am I going to make my ends meet how, how am I going to do this and how am I going to do that let's give you another scenario that doesn't involve relationships sometimes in our jobs we're asked to do things that we know that are not in line with our Christian values but yet I have to keep my job and so what do you do do you trust God and do you do what God wants you to do or do you conform to your boss or the requirements of the job because I need this job to pay my bills can I tell you who your source is and who your source has always been believe it or not I know you have a job we all have jobs but that job is not your source God is your source, and he has promised that I will supply every one of your needs according to my riches in glory. And we say that and we repeat that. It falls off of our lips like water. But do we honestly believe that God will supply? Do we honestly believe? And I'm telling you, I have seen God supernaturally provide. Yes. Let's close with a joke. There was a lady who was a, 
an older lady. She was a, a senior citizen, and she trusted in God, and she lived next door to an atheist, a man who did not believe that God existed. And he always mocked her and made fun of her. And, and one day she ran out of, of all of her supplies, and she was praying and talking to the God. She says, God, she says, I'm going to believe you to supply my needs. She told the man, she says, God's going to do it. And so he was going to make fun of her. And so he went and he bought her a whole bunch of groceries and he put it on the step, but he didn't tell her it was him. And he ran away, right? And so she came to the door and she saw all these groceries and she just stood up and she, be, she says, God, I thank you for providing. And he ran out and he laughed and he laughed. He said, God didn't provide that for you. He said, I went and bought those groceries and I put those groceries on your step. She says, God, I thank you. You made an atheist provide for me. God, I thank you. <laughs> So see, you got to trust God either way. Father, we just want to say thank you today because even before we acknowledged you as being first in our life, even before we acknowledged you as being the God who takes care of us, who watches over us, who provides for us, even before we knew we had that kind of relationship, all of our lives from our birth up until this present moment, you've been taking care of us. You've been making a way for us. You've been opening doors for us. You've been sustaining us and keeping us even before we decided to call you God. But God, now that we have the relationship with you, and we looked at the scripture this morning that says that we are supposed to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might, God, help us to realign and reposition ourselves. God, we repent because we have made so many life decisions without even considering whether or not it was within your will. And we read this morning where the word of God says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but acknowledge him in all of thy ways, and he will direct our paths. God, help us to come to a place in our trust in you that we accept the fact that a no from you is better than a yes from us. Even when you tell us no, and we still want to do it, Help us to trust in your no rather than our yes. Hide this word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Now, Father, we're getting ready to celebrate the relationship that we have with you in the form of Holy Communion. I pray that you would sanctify our hearts, O God. Put us in the place where we need to be. Remind us, O God, of the relationship. We are the bride of Christ and you are our husband. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm only going to have one appeal today, and that one appeal today is for membership. Uh, you call it partnership. Uh, it, it's where you formally affiliate yourself with this ministry, and you can formally say that I've gone through the New Beginnings class. This is my church. This is where I am a partner. This is where I am a member. And so we'd like to give you an opportunity uh, to become a part of this fellowship, and there are several ways you can do it. Um, Hold on. See, I know I'm tired. That's the wrong appeal. That appeal is not the important appeal. The important appeal is the appeal for you to be saved. Please forgive me. And so right now, what we want to do, talking about priority, I just, that, all that preaching is messed up on the end. <laughs> <laughs> the most important priority is not that you become a partner with this church. The most important priority is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the number one priority. And so we'll deal with church affiliations later, so let's take care of this appeal. Um, if you're in this place and you have not made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen. It is not hard. When I was a young man and uh, the Lord kept dealing with me, I, I felt like I, I would miss something. I felt like I had to stop parting. I had to stop doing all of this stuff. If I'm going to do it, I really want to be serious about it. And so what I did is I put it off and I put it off and I put it off. But here's the thing. Who told you that you're going to get another opportunity after today? You see? And so in the day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And so if you are in this place, forget about you not being perfect. You will never be perfect. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross not for perfect people, but for jacked up people. And so what he's saying is, trust what I've done on the cross. Just come to me just like you are. And I promise you, if you will come into a relationship with him and begin to read your word, begin to fellowship with other believers, it may take a little while, but you're going to see your life change. You're going to see God begin to manifest 
manifest himself in your life. It's not going to happen overnight, but you've got to trust him. And then stop trying to just do this and work and work and please God. Just come to him the way that you are and let him begin to work from the inside out and change your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Saints of God are praying. If what I said resonated with you this morning and you want to go ahead and make that decision, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. Right where you're sitting, you can raise your hand in the air and say, Pastor, I heard you. I understood you. And today I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. If that's you, would you please lift your hand up in the air and we're going to pray with you today before you go home. And you can leave this building not wondering, not guessing, but knowing that you have a right relationship with the Lord. And if you die today, that you will be in his presence forevermore. And so if there's anyone here, I need you to raise your hand. Way back there in the back. Okay, now I, I see you. Don't, don't let, let them do it on their own. <laughs> let them do it on their own. Okay, now I'm about to challenge your faith. If your hand is up, I want to challenge you to stand to your feet, make your way down your aisle to the row, and then come up front. You say, Pastor, why is that important? Jesus said something that was very profound. He said, If you are ashamed to own me before men, do you know what Jesus said? He said, I will be ashamed to own you before my father. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed to own me before his father. And so if you raise your hand, I know you did not plan on this today, but I'm going to ask you one more time. Please stand immediately. Don't let the devil from hell stop you and make your way to the aisle. Y'all pray because this is a hard decision for some folk. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> don't let the moment rob you. Thank you, Lord. There were some folk back there in the back. Don't let the moment rob you of what the Lord is asking you to do today. Hallelujah. I need all you guys to come right over here. Now, there, there's more than two of you, but you, you guys have the nerve, the gumption to stand up. And just, I, I know it's hard. I know you didn't plan on doing this when you were getting up, getting ready. Come on, we got a brother coming in the wheelchair. Let's wait on him, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want all of you all to think about something. There are some people that raised their hands that did not come, but I want you to think about something. Even though you guys are, are pretty young, by and large, you have made millions of decisions in your life. Some small decisions, some major decisions. When you got up this morning, you made a decision to come to church. When you got in the car, you made a decision to go this way or that way. When you woke up, you made a decision to put on certain clothes. You will make those are light decisions. You're going to make some important decisions. Marriages, houses, careers, those are going to be important decisions. But the most important decision that you will ever make in life, you just made it. Because, listen, because a lot of those decisions that I talked to you about before, the day-to-day -day decisions of life, they have natural consequences. But the decision that you just made was a spiritual decision, and it has spiritual consequences because you have now stepped into something that's called eternal life. I'm going to say something to you that's going to blow your mind. You will never die. Amen. Now, your physical body will go back to the earth because that's what God says. But trust me when I tell you this, you will never lose consciousness. You are going to move, when, whenever that time comes, you will step out of one dimension and into another dimension because you have now been born again. And I think we ought to put our hands together and give the Lord praise for that. Hallelujah. And when you truly, when you truly understand the beauty of being born again, do you know what it does? It casts out all fear. You're no longer afraid to die. You're no longer afraid of these things because you realize to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I have nothing to lose either way and everything to gain in Jesus' name. So let's thank the Lord for what he's done in these three people's hearts. These, um, Thelma, come and help the gentleman here. They're going to take you guys to a private room away from everybody else, put some very important materials in your hand. The most important thing I can say to you is don't turn back. Stay faithful. Stay committed. Keep going forward. Once you put your hand to this plow, don't let it go. Remember, the devil is a stalker and a jealous lover. He doesn't worry about you as long as you're with him. It's when you decide to go a different way that he unleashes everything to try to get you to come back. But I thank God that a better testimony is there for you. Please follow her. Let's give the Lord praise. Let's get ready for Holy Communion.
What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, what does this mean? What we're getting ready to do. Okay. Now, let's, let's see if we can put these pieces together. Do you remember where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you shall be there also. You remember that? He said, for in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. Where does this all fit together in imagery and, and Hebrew and he, uh, Judeo-Christian theology? Back in those days in the Hebrew culture, when a person was espoused to another young lady, there was a cup. And this cup was a promise that they drank that cup. And when you drank that cup, that espousal cup, the bride, would, the, the groom would go away and he would go to his father's house and he would build a place for his new bride and then he would come back to get his bride and bring her into the house. Brothers, you hear me say this all the time. Don't get married until you have a place to take your new bride to. You see, and so because we are the bride of Christ, what we're doing is we're rehearsing the wedding ceremony. You see, and so every time we take this cup, we're remembering that we have a spouse. We have someone that we are married to. We are a part of the bride of Christ, the body and the bride of Christ. And one day he's going to come back and we're going to consummate the wedding ceremony and we will rule and reign with the Lord forever. That sounds almost sophomore. It doesn't sound like a little kiddie story. But see, you got to have childlike faith in order to walk with God to believe these things. And so on that night, the Lord took a cup. He said, this cup represents, before we do that, I'm sorry, I'm sleepy again. He took a piece of bread and he said, uh, this bread represents my body. And he broke the bread and he blessed it and he commanded them to eat. Let us do likewise. Then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the New Testament, the new covenant agreement, the new contract. He said, each time we do this, we are to remember the relationship that we have with him and also the cost of that relationship. He was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement that we should have taken it was placed upon him let us drink Jesus told a story about the wedding feast you remember he told a story about ten virgins you all remember that and five of those virgins were wise and five were foolish and when it was time for the groom to come back and together his bride the five that were wise had their oils, their lamps trimmed with oil, and they turned their lamps on at night because he came at midnight and they could see. But the five foolish brides, they weren't ready, and they didn't have any oil in their lamp. And so the groom and the bride and his wives, they left together, but those that weren't ready, they missed it. What am I trying to tell you? Keep your lamps trimmed because you never know when the Lord is going to come back. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above, all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. To the, God, to the God who says to us today, I am able to present you faultless before my presence with exceeding glory. I'm able to keep you from falling. To you, O God, we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. And all of God's children said with a loud, happy, and hilarious voice. Amen. And until we see you again, may God's richest and God's best be yours. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday.